people of God say thank you, Jesus. Hey, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. First, let me give praise, glory, and honor to God, our Father, who has allowed all of us to be here today. Even if this is not your local church, it's still the house of the Lord. And it is always good to be in his presence. To our pastor, Reverend Kimberly Redmond Jones, praise the Lord. She's sure enough pastor now. She's out. Well, she's coming in now. Amen. And to the first gentleman, Brother Jeff. And to the first children, Kayla and Cynthia. I saw Cynthia when I came in in the back. She was greeting. I said, are you the greeter today? She said, no, but I'm, I'm back here, and, and I'm just going to say hello. Amen. Good to see the family doing ministry together. To all of the members of Gibbs Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church in North Miami, it is so good to be in your presence one more time. And to my colleagues, two of them who are here today, Pastor Robinson, the pastor at Salter Chapel, and then former pastor, thank you very much, at Salter's Chapel there in Miami, and then Reverend Yaxley Jameson, pastor at Hearst Chapel. They still, it call, they still call it Perrine. Amen. <laughs> to God be the glory. And to my family, the Mount Hermon family. I thank I thank you. I thank you, students, choir, ushers, members, stewards, all of you for coming. We've been quite busy lately, but I thank God for giving the members a little more extra strength uh, to come and to share with, with not only friends, but family members in Reverend Kimberly Redmond Jones and First Gentleman Jeffrey Jones and their daughters. To my wife, Reverend Tamira, uh, who who stands by my side and we are grateful to God to be able to share in ministry and I thank God for for her all the time and I know I see a lot of your family members and a lot of them are members at St. James right amen and so good to see all of you praise the Lord been knowing most of you a long time and we'll leave it right there. Amen. Uh, and to God be the glory. I want to say this, um, and I want to, before I go into my text, I want to apologize publicly and openly to the members of Gibbs Chapel. It is not something that my wife and I practice, and I wish I didn't have to do it. Um, you prepare food for us, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to stay and eat and I don't want you to take it personal. I've got a plane to catch. I've got to be in Dayton later tonight where the low is zero. Amen. The low is zero. Amen. And it may get up to two degrees tomorrow. But we praise God and, and we, we're going to get to the airport in time to make the flight. But I thank you for thinking about us and preparing the food. And certainly I'm going to eat it on the way to the airport because it will be my last meal. Amen. Um, I also want to take a moment to say these words to the Gibbs Chapel family. I, I, I know this is your 67th church anniversary. And I've been coming in and out of Gibbs Chapel for a number of years. And it's always good to come and see you progressing. Because the last time I was here, these chairs were not here. 
So that's progress. Amen. Come on, let's give God some praise. And, and we thank God for the way in which he has kept you as a congregation. Now, I know Reverend Jones asked me to preach, and I wouldn't dare tell her what my preaching schedule has been like for the past two weeks. But I am going to do what she has asked me to do. And I'm going to come and say a word with the little bitty voice that I have left. Amen. And ask for your prayers. Uh, let me ask everyone to please stand. For almost six months now, the Lord has laid a scripture in my heart, in my spirit, that I have not been able to turn a loose, or it has not turned me a loose. Everywhere I've gone over the past several months, this text keeps coming up. And so today I want to read this text in your hearing and leave these words with you. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, I would like to invite you to open God's word and hear what God is saying in these words, starting at verse number 13 down through verse number 19. Now, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Now, before you take your seat, will you look at the person standing next to you? And will you say to them, I will build my church. I will build my church. Now, b before anybody takes this the wrong way, I've been A.M.E. all my life, and I want to be clear on who we're talking about. Jesus. I didn't want you to tell your neighbor that you're going to build your church because a lot of folk think it's theirs. But he says, I'm going to build my church. So, so will you tell your neighbor, then you can take your seat. Tell him we're talking about Jesus' church. This is an interesting text. Members of Mount Hermon, many of them have sat under my teaching as I've been teaching on this text. But the more you dig into this text, some things it brings out kind of makes you wonder why Jesus does what he does. Now, for those of you who really follow this text, Jesus is now in his third year of ministry. He's on his way to die. He's been on the earth now three years going all around the region doing what 
God has called and anointed and ordained him to do. Now, the Bible says that Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Oh, Bible scholars ought to read on what the region of Caesarea Philippi is. Jesus takes his disciples, the 12 men that he has chosen to follow him and to impregnate them with the word of God. He takes them to a place that is known for death. In fact, Caesarea Philippi is not only a place associated with death, but they worshiped idols that represented death. He brings them with him to Caesarea Philippi, and he asks them a question. What are the people saying about me? He didn't ask them this question for gossip. He didn't ask them this question because he didn't know who he was. After three years of laboring and walking with Jesus, he wanted to know, what are the people saying about me? Who do the people say that I am? Now, beloved, you've got to watch this thing because they, you know, got in a little state of silence and they didn't know what they should say. And then they spoke up and they said to him, some say you are John the Baptist raised from the dead. Jesus' miraculous work shows that he is someone special and John the Baptist was the most recent someone special of whom they were aware. And so the people were unaware that Jesus and John were contemporaries and that John had baptized Jesus. And so the others agreed that Jesus was someone special and, and so they thought he might be Elijah the prophet. According to Malachi 4 and 5, we are to lose to as a returning as the forerunner of the Messiah. The, the, the people were unaware that Jesus had already said that John the Baptist had fulfilled this role. They know who he was. And then others said that, that Jesus was Jeremiah the prophet. This was based on a tradition that Jeremiah would return prior to the coming of the Messiah to restore the ark and the altar to their proper places in the temple. The people did not know that this tradition has no basis in God's revelation and is not even true. But yet they thought he was Jeremiah. And still others agreed that Jesus was someone special, but they did not know who, perhaps just one of the prophets of old risen back to life. The people were at least honest enough to say they did not know they were confused. But I don't know about you. When I, when I started reading this text, and, and, and I saw how Jesus was maneuvering. The thing that struck me as interesting was after three years, they told him what the people were saying, but they themselves did not know who he was either. Now he asked them the question, you told me what they said. Now I want to know, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? And then, ha, ah, you got to watch this thing. It gets very interesting because silence went across the disciples' little rank. None of them knew what to say. They, 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 they thought one of the others would speak up and say something, and none of them said anything. And, and now Jesus is there, ask a question that they cannot answer. Isn't it something? You've been in the church a long time, and some folks still don't know who Jesus is. We come to church, we worship, we get our praise on, but when it rubber hits the road, some folk just know about him, they don't know him. And so Jesus raises the question, and, and he wants to know, but who do you say that I am? And old loud mouth cussing Peter spoke up, and at the moment he began to talk. You got to read this text for what it says. The Lord God Father Almighty grabbed his tongue and got the words that were coming out of his mouth. And out of nowhere, Peter began to say, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. 
And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but only my Father which is in heaven. In other words, Peter was talking what he didn't really know. God had to give him revelation. And that is when Jesus now turns to Peter and he says to him, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, you got to back up just a little bit. I'm going somewhere with this thing. Now, watch this. When Peter speaks up and says that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Peter is direct and to the point. He's been given the words to say by, by, by Jesus' father who is in heaven. But see, Peter didn't recognize what he was saying because God was the one doing the talking. Anybody ever been there? God had to some, come, somehow step into what you've been talking about and God has to speak out of your mouth and then you wonder, what did I just say? Peter had a Holy Ghost moment, if you will. Peter had a, a, a God moment, if you will. Peter now has revelation of who he's been watching for the past three years. And it was at that point that Jesus said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Can I tell you what he was really saying? He said, Peter, upon the revelation of you knowing who I am, I'm going to build my church. Can I tell you something, Gibbs Chapel? You can't build God's church with brick and mortar. You cannot build God's church with windows and pane. You cannot build God's church with carpet and pews. You cannot build God's church with money and finance. You can only build God's church with a revelation. Look at the person seated next to you and tell, do you know who he is? Peter didn't know who he was, but he was getting ready to know. Jesus has now brought Peter into a deeper revelation. See, when you know who Jesus is, some other things go along with it. Uh, I'm almost finished. Uh, I, 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 I don't know what it is about church folk who, who get too much world in them. We can't do that. That's too much for us. We can't afford that. Right? Now, I I'm talking about church folk who have no revelation of Jesus. Because if you know who Jesus is, let's go after it. If you know who Jesus is, let's go get it. I if you know who Jesus is, it's going to be saved. If you know who Jesus is, it's already out. If you know who Jesus is. You see, folk who, 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 who belittle the church, folk who made the church about everything but Jesus, they, they don't believe they have power. They don't believe that they have a strong anointing. They don't believe that they can do anything. They don't believe that God is in charge. They don't believe that God can take nothing and make something. They don't believe that folk will come. You see, we're trying all these tactics and trying all of these new theories on how to get folk in church. The mothers and fathers of old knew how to get folk in church. Just tell some folk about Jesus. We stopped talking about Jesus and we talk about everything else but Jesus. You are the Christ. Christ means Messiah, the one who's coming to save us from our sin. That's why every now and then when you get bad, you ought to say, I know who he is. He saved me. He redeemed me. He brought me out of darkness into his light. He's made me who I am. I'm talking about building the church. I'm almost finished. Now watch this. Reverend Kim, a lot of things have been said by Gibbs Chapel. A lot of pastors have come before you. But don't you ever let anybody tell you that the church is dead. In fact, if anybody has ever said the church is dead, you've lied on Jesus. Y'all going to let me preach this, this today? After Peter got a revelation of Jesus and who he was, Jesus came back and gave him some reassurance. He says, upon this rock, rock meaning the, the, the revelation of who I am. U upon this rock, I'm, I'm going to build my church and, and the gates of Hades. Some modern translations 
translate that word into hell, but the proper word is Hades. Hades is a place of death. Hades is dead. Hades is, is, is the worship of death and the presence of death. And Jesus said, upon the revelation of who I am, the very gates of Hades shall not overpower the church. In other words, can I just say it now? If anything is dead in the church, it ain't the church, it's you. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. Somebody said he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. The church ain't dead as some dead folk in the church. The church is alive because the church has been built on a revelation of a living Savior. Somebody, somebody sitting out there probably saying, oh, preacher, I hear what you're saying, but ain't nobody coming to our church. People ain't coming like they used to come. People ain't singing like they used to sing. People ain't ushering like they used to usher. People ain't serving as students like they used to serve. People ain't giving like they used to give. Are you talking about Jesus like you used to? <laughs> Reverend Kim, I I'm going to say it and then I'm going to get up out of here. Don't y'all bother anybody next to you. Sometimes you got to just tell folk, shut up if you ain't got nothing to say. And a whole lot of folk talking, but they ain't saying nothing. A whole lot of folk just rambling out the mouth, but they ain't saying anything. You know, if my church were in trouble, I'd try to get folk to talk about the one who established the church. I'm not talking about a man. I'm talking about the son of the living God. You see, as long as you know who Jesus is, you ain't got to worry about filling up pews. As long as you know who Jesus is, you ain't got to worry where the money is coming from. As long as you got a revelation of who Jesus is, he'll even come in and heal the sick, raise the dead. Because when you know who Jesus is, you've got all the power you need and watch this he'll even keep death off of your church because when he has the revelation in you now you know what you can do ah, but, but now let me go on and finish so I can get on this plane <laughs> Ooh, this text is so powerful Elder Howard because when I go back and look at the text, Jesus not only said that he would keep the gates of Hades away, but then he says here in that same, in that same pericope, he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, that, 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 that ought to make some folks shout right now. In other words, what Jesus was saying was, you ain't got to put up with everything. Some stuff that don't look like God, you bind it on earth, it's going to be bound in heaven. You loose it on earth, it's going to be loosed in heaven. If ain't no anointing in your church, what you got to do is bind that which is causing the anointing not to flow, and it'll be bound in heaven. I tell you, ain't nothing worse in the world than a dead worship service. Folk who've been blessed by God, folk who've been sanctified by God, folk who've been given money by God, folk who've been blessed with houses by God, folk who've been blessed with a mind by God, come to church and don't want to worship the devil is a liar when I go back and look at how good God has been I got out of the pump up business a long time ago if I gotta pump you up to worship God the devil is a liar because God has been better to you than he's been to me ain't nobody gotta ask me to stand and wave my hand because when I think of the goodness of the Lord and all that the Lord has done for me if you ain't got nothing to say let me say it for you he's my rock he's my redeemer he's my way maker he's my I promise, keep up. Mm. Uh, uh, oh, 
almost finished. I'm, I'm, I, I'm almost finished. I, 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 I'm almost finished. But I got to talk about how you're going to build his church. Because right now, we're in warfare. And, and the church seems like it's on the losing end. But can I tell you something? <laughs> when the shutdown came, a whole lot of folk were wondering what we're going to do now. <laughs> But the church should have remembered, we serve a risen Savior. If you've been shut down, that means you've been set up. Because anything that's been shut down has only been put on a temporary hold. Because when God has been confronted by the enemy, God says that just opens the door to show who I really am. When the Trump administration shut down the government, they didn't know they were setting up for God to show his mighty hand. And some of you in this room today, you ought to know, shut down only meant that God is getting ready to open up. And God's getting ready to open up a floodgate. You gotta stop walking around singing everybody else's song. The country has gone to hell. Nobody is living right. That's not the message Jesus gave you. Jesus told you to tell the world, I live, and because I live, you shall live. When the thing came that the shutdown was in, you should have been telling folk God still got you in his hand. He's still a protector. He's still a provider. He's still a way out of no way. You ought to tell folk God's getting ready to break loose a miracle. Look at somebody and tell them when the last time you had a miracle in your life. Somebody said, I got one this morning. When I woke up and opened my eyes, that was a miracle. I know I ought to be dead, but I'm still alive. The devil is a liar. So I don't need anybody to tell me to lift my hand. If my right foot can hold me up, my left foot can complement my right foot. I've got to say something. Do you know who he really is? Do you really know him? Or you just know what somebody told you? Do you really know him? Look at the person seated next to you and tell them, don't fool me. Now, do you know him? Huh. Every now and then, you ought to ask somebody, what do you know about him? <laughs> if you've never been through anything, you really don't know him. Because you get to know him better when you've been through something. When folk have walked away and left you, you know who he is. When the devil has used you for a punching bag, you know him. When the bottom has fallen out, you know him. You know that he is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. He is a promise keeper. He is the light in darkness. If you mess around with me, I may tell you he's my rose of Sharon. He's my lily of the valley. He's my bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's my daddy when my daddy is gone. He's been my mama when my mama got sick. But I can't stop right there. He's been my road dog. He's written up all the down the road with me. He's been the co-pilot in the plane that I've had to fly on. Yes, that's who he is. He's my doctor. He's my lawyer. He's my all in all. And with that testimony, the church will begin to grow. But the church ain't going to grow if you ain't got nothing to say. You got to tell everybody, white, black, and Hispanic, let me tell you who Jesus is. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. Hug your neighbor, tell your neighbor, I know who he is. I'm going to close with this. I was doing a workshop the other day. Somebody came to me after the workshop. They said, Reverend Bowie, appreciate everything that you said in this workshop. You told us who stewards are and what they're supposed to do. You told us who trustees are and what they're supposed to do. And he said, but you don't know the folk in my church.
I said, what do you mean? He said, folk in my church, they defy all logic. I say, brother, what are you talking about? He said, I just can't figure them out. So I, I said, come on, let's go over here. Let's talk. I said, so when you talk to the members of your church, what are you telling them? He said, can I say it in church? I say, my Lord, is it that bad? <laughs> and when he finished telling me everything that he says to them, I said these words to him. Brother, you have perpetuated a spirit in your church that doesn't look like Christ. He said, what do you mean? I said, why would anybody want to join a church where the members are defeated before they even get started? He said, I never, I've never seen it like you saying it. I said, there's no other way to see it. If out of your mouth comes poison, then you're going to poison everybody you talk to. But if what comes out of your mouth is life, everybody you come in contact with will find life. So I said to him, when you get back to your church, speak life. Some of us in here right now, the stuff that we've gone through has just about taken the life out of us. But how many of you know, I preached this early this morning, Reverend Kim. What do you do when the brook dries up? You've got to know, sometimes God will dry up a brook to get you from depending on the brook and depend on the one who made the brook. Sometimes God will stop the grub hub ravens from bringing meat and bread in the morning and meat and bread in the evening. And God wants you to fix your eyes on the one who provides. So on this 67th church anniversary it gives, Jesus says, I want to build my church in you. I want to make you a light. I want to make you a star. I want to make you an angel. I want to make you a witness. I want to give you a testimony. Here, here, here it is. Right now. All over the room. Those of you who are able to stand. Can you stand to your feet? turn and look at somebody right now tell them let me tell you what the Lord has done for me